You may have heard of The Wave, or perhaps Antelope Canyon near Page, Arizona. But we wanted to get away from the crowds and immerse ourselves in geologic beauty for several days. So we through-hiked Perea Canyon from White House to Lee's Ferry over a five-day period. This hike has it all. 2,000 foot canyon walls, 200 million years of geologic history, 700 years of human habitation. What you are seeing here is the intimate slot canyon of Buckskin Gulch. Oh, and there's the water. The Perea River that formed this deep canyon that feeds into the Colorado River. The river's name, sometimes spelled P-A-H-R-E-A-H, is Paiute for muddy water. In this little video, I'll give you a good idea of what it's like to make this trip with enough details that will help you plan your own outing. Many groups do this trip in four days, but we opted for five days to allow time for the shuttle to and from the trailhead and a half day for a side trip into Buckskin Gulch. This was a nice eight to nine mile per day pace for a group ranging in age from 40 to 67. The first challenge of this trip is securing a permit. They go fast and we had ours in hand just a few minutes after they opened up on New Year's Day. Our first day was a busy one. Shuttle 150 miles to the trailhead from the parking lot at Lee's Ferry, stop at the visitor center to pick up our hard copy permit and wag bags, and finally hike seven miles to the first campsite south of the Buckskin Canyon confluence. Perea Outpost and Outfitters dropped us off at about 11 a.m. and after about a half Half an hour of ogling the cliffs and organizing our gear, we hit the trail after taking the obligatory group photo. It didn't take long before we encountered the first water. Don't even think about keeping your feet dry on this hike. There's no way to avoid sloshing for hours in and out of the stream. I wore merino wool and gingy socks and ultra lone peak trail running shoes and had no problems with cold feet nor blisters. There will be times where your boots will get covered in mud, but a quick swish in the stream and you'll be good to go. In just a few minutes, you start to encounter breathtaking rock formations like these sandstone canyon walls that look like hardened mud to me. In a couple miles, the narrows begin. The walls start to rise up and close in on you. The afternoon sun makes for magical lighting. Soon after, you come to Slide Rock Arch, a delightful rock that everyone can walk beneath. We were lucky. And after passing through the arch and looking back, the shadows look like a woman sitting on the canyon floor with her knees up. Can you see her? Just as we arrived at our campsite, a group galloped by on horseback. Quite a sight to see. The doggies running alongside looked like they were having the time of their lives. With the canyon walls as a backdrop, it was really stunning. Don't see that every day. Uh-uh. My battery was empty. I could take a picture. We set up camp on the well-worn site and made preparations for a community dinner that included homemade bread and fresh banana pudding. Here's my tent and campsite up against the canyon walls to cut down on the wind. I had to get creative with hanging my pack to keep it off the ground and away from any rodents. Day two dawned and I sat and watched the sunlight creep down the canyon as I drank my morning coffee. Our plan was to spend the morning exploring up buckskin, then hike to Big Spring Campsite in the afternoon. Back at the confluence, someone had marked the Utah-Arizona state line in the sand. Not sure how accurate the location was, but we were definitely going back and forth between the two states. The confluence is an interesting spot where the three canyons merge. Up the gulch, upstream towards White House the way we had come the day before, and downstream to our campsite. It's hard to express what it's like to walk through buckskin. The walls are so high, the rock formations so dramatic and colorful. We were lucky, I guess, with the dry conditions this year. 
the flow of water was minimal, so we really didn't have to get too wet. Of course, the photo opportunities are endless. Be prepared to spend some time getting shots for your friends in front of the more interesting rock formations. It was a challenge for me as the videographer to get horizontal or landscape shots. The canyon is so high and narrow that it forces you to take vertical or portrait shots to get the sense of scale. No matter, it's all good. We decided to turn around at the rock slide where some climbing was involved. We had a party of backpackers in front of us that were moving slowly through the obstacle course and it was about time to get back to our campsite for lunch anyway. It was interesting to see where different paths have been made through this area as the rocks shifted during flooding. One of the things that makes this place so special is the changing light. Depending on the orientation to the sun angle, it can go from being quite dark to very bright sunlight. It's fun to watch the light change as you walk. After lunch, we headed south. The canyon opens up a little bit and the spots where the canyon makes a sharp curve make for an interesting spot to take a break. So we are camped right over there amongst those maple trees. And uh, pretty handy, here is Big Spring. And this is the biggest spring we've seen so far on the Perea. And uh, it's got a, a pretty good flow coming out of there. You see? Pretty nice little spot. I think we'll have good water tonight. You can see there's a ton of seeps coming out of the water, uh, out of the wall here at Big Spring. So you've got all that moss and, and ferns forming on there. And uh, you can just see the water just raining down, fresh as could be. Yes, a couple of the stronger hikers even brought a couple of beers that we cooled in the fresh spring water. This IPA from the Mother Road Brewery in Flagstaff tasted mighty good with dinner. After dinner, we relaxed by the spring with some adult beverages and cigars. Life is good. Day three was a beautiful hike from Big Spring to the mouth of Rather Canyon, not too far from the arch. The canyon is a little more open along this stretch, but the walls are so high and colorful that you can't stop gaping. I don't know if it's noticeable in the video, but it seemed like there was a lot more flow in the river downstream of Big Spring. For what it's worth, we drank filtered water from the river where spring water was not available. The river water was very clear with very little silt, probably due to the lack of rainfall lately. The campsites are at the mouth of Rather Canyon on a sandbar. The best sites are actually on the southern end, so keep going once you see the first sites. This area is quite open and windy, and we had some issues with blowing sand. There are a number of good-sized cottonwood trees around the camp, and one of the things I didn't expect to see is fairly recent beaver activity. You wouldn't think there would be enough trees to supply the beavers with dam material, but there's no doubt what not on these tree trunks. I was too tired to make the hike, but several members of our group made the three-mile round trip to the arch. They described it as steep, but the trail was well trod. The arch was not obvious until you get pretty close. On the morning of day four, the wind died down a bit and we were there as the cottonwoods were just going to seed. Our goal was to hike to the last campsite prior to the high and dry area where the trail moves up and away from the river. Stephen got a head start on the rest of us that morning. As you can see, no matter how hard you try to dry your shoes and socks overnight, first thing in the morning you are wet again within the first couple of minutes. It's nice on a hot day at noon, 
but a little bracing first thing in the morning. A few minutes later, the rest of us headed out. Not easy to roust up nine hikers and get them on the trail every morning. There are no trail markers and more often than not, no trail. As you can see here, you often have multiple options which way to go. Stay in the water or walk on the sand. Footprints from prior hikers are not always a good indication of the best route as they may have been made when the water level was higher or lower. One of the pleasures of day four was walking in these red rock areas. The sand can be like walking on a beach and the firmness of the dry rock is a nice change of pace. The campsite just before the high and dry was spacious with lots of river views. The next morning I had a great view of the sun creeping up this mountain on the far side of the canyon. At the start of the high and dry we encountered one of the very few areas where the footing was a little sketchy. We all got through okay, but it did slow us down just a bit. The high and dry trail is very loose sand which expends a lot of energy to walk in, but it is easy on the feet. Some people make the claim that it's not worth hiking all the way to Lee's Ferry, but I found the views of the canyon walls really stunning. There are some interesting areas of strange soil along this section. Kind of reminds me of the Badlands in the Dakotas or the Painted Desert in Arizona. We all speculated on the geology and minerals that made up these areas, but nobody knew the facts. If you know about these deposits, drop me a note in the comments. I'd appreciate it. Walking on this stuff was really interesting. It has a dry, hard crust that gets pulverized by your footsteps. Soon after, we came to the petroglyphs. It's a really nice collection, despite the inevitable graffiti added by modern-day visitors. Some, like the desert bighorn sheep, were easy to decode, but most of them seemed pretty opaque. This critter, whatever it was, just didn't make it. We saw little evidence of animal life on our hike, just the beaver gnawings and some bighorn sheep scat. Many areas along this stretch had a salt crust to them. My guess is it is some sort of calcium salt deposit, but I have no way of verifying that. When we came to the old graveyard, we knew we were near the end of our hike. The people that lived and died here must have had a tough life, but definitely surrounded by a lot of natural beauty. Our last task on exiting the trail was to dump our wag bags in the receptacle provided by the Park Service. Lord knows we were happy to get rid of four mornings of toilet duty, though I have to say the wag bags were straightforward to use and worked well. Hey, thanks for watching. I hope you learned something that motivated you to hike Perea Canyon and maybe helped you prepare for your journey. If you did, please click like or subscribe to my channel below, or leave me a comment. I love hearing from the kind folks that watch my videos. See you on the trail.